five, four, three, two, one. I'm John Miglosh for the Wisconsin DMA and the news. Here we go. Let's get over to Tom Fishburn and see what he's got to say. But first, don't forget, Thursday, this Thursday, we're having a WDMA spring meetup, and we sent out a, a, a slick little email yesterday so that you can just click on that I'd like to uh, I'd like to go to the meetup, and um, then you're all registered. We know you're coming, and we're all set, and the Zoom link will be there, and uh, you can also add it to your calendar all right from that one little email without having to register or type in or anything. Uh, it's super slick from the uh, style consultant, so that's excellent. And I'll keep that going down at the bottom, the sliders going, so you know what's what. Anyway, so let's talk about Tom Fishburne. Market, product, market fit. Excellent article, as usual. Uh, it says, we don't appear to have product market fit, but maybe that will change if we just raise millions and millions of dollars. And, of course, we had a story, and this, maybe this is what prompted Tom, a story like that this past week. A company raised or spent I don't know what they raised, but they spent $300 million launching a new streaming service, and uh, nobody's home. Uh, they, they shut it down within, less, I think, less than 30 days they shut it down. Um, so there you go. Um, and let's go down and see what Tom has to say. A CB Insights study found that 35% of startups failed because they launched – a product with no market need. Now I'm launching a product right now, and, and that's a really interesting part. And so I'm, I'm trying to take this to heart personally and say, well, do I have a market need? I don't know. We're shipping our first boxes right now, but before I, but one of the things I did is I decided to protect it a little with a patent and get it, get it produced by companies that could scale it up if if we wanted to, but not right away. So I'm funding it right now, and I'm talking to a lot of people, and there's some interest, I have to say, but it's not, you know, it's not a barn burner, but, but partly it, it isn't proven yet. We don't even know if it works, and, it, and it'll take probably another eight or nine months, maybe a year before we really know if it works, and so we have to be ready to scale up for next year. Anyway, scaling growth before having product market fit is the fastest way to kill your startup. Another thing I've noticed in startups is there's a sort of an initial enthusiasm. And you may get investors, but even if you don't get investors per se explicitly, you might get help from vendors that know you or from uh, supp other suppliers that know them or something like that. And you can get started getting it rolling. But then as time goes on with successive failures, you get less and less um, enthusiasm and there's a clock ticking when you start a product there's a clock ticking and uh, once you miss that first you, you know once you, you start with the wave and get going you can launch it but if you don't there's a lot of paddling involved so finding product market fit has become the standard VC checklist that's venture capital checklist to evaluate new ideas the concept originated with Sequoia founder Don Valentine uh, and Benchmark co-founder Andy Ra uh, Ratchiff, I guess, but famously was popularized by Mark Anderson in 2007 in a post called The Only Thing That Matters. And Mark wrote in that post, the only thing that matters is getting to product market fit. And it's, it is interesting, back to my product, is that our first uh, our first few tries at a selling proposition were tremendously unsuccessful and now we're just starting to get some traction with a completely different perspective same product but a different a different you know headline a different explanation of why this is important why it applies to people to to people new to the hobby or people that have been in it for 40 years so a lot of times it takes successive uh, tries and talking to people and finding out what, you know, what is the hot button. It's not necessarily the product that changes, but it might be the way of talking about it. So product market fit means being in a good market with a product that can satisfy that market. In a great market, a market with lots of real potential customers, the market pulls the product out of startup. That's a really brilliant idea. 
something that I've neglected and ignored a couple of times. The 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 market, you know, it's it's the old. If you build a better mouse trap, the the world will beat a path to your door, and it's probably not true, and it's famously not true, but there's some truth in it. If you build it, they will come. If it's re, it really satisfies a need in a unique way, probably it probably is more like that than not. Um, lack of product market fit contributes massively to the fun, well-funded, massively funded flameouts like QB and last week's shuttering of CNN Plus by CNN. Yeah, $300 million dumped on the, the rollout of that. So when you have this kind of hype and this kind of funding, it's easy to overlook or ignore early warning signs that there's no market need. The past path of least resistance is to continue to throw good money after bad, right? As Ritson said, the, the, the ability to shut things down may be the greatest test of a CEO. Sean Ellis created the 40% test to help gauge product market fit. He says, you ask products, you ask customers who've used the product if they if they could no longer use the product, would they be very disappointed, somewhat disappointed, or not disappointed? And once 40% of the customers respond very disappointed, Sean believed the product was on its way towards scalable growth. So they would miss it. They would really miss it if they couldn't have that product. And that's something, that's a really good test. And so we'll we'll keep that in mind as we roll out our new com our new company. <laughs> Okay, I think it's an interesting question to pose to any new product as we launch. Not only is it something customers will want, but is it something customers don't want to do without? Great question. Okay, our startup ID, October 2014. It's, it, it's like Uber meets Warby Parker meets Bir Birchbox meets Snapchat meets SD meets something we haven't thought of yet. You had us at like Uber. Yeah, of course, that was a, that's been had some challenges. What you call a colossal failure that jeopardizes everything I call a pivot. And there's some truth to that. This was a good one. What is our marketing strategy? Is marketing marketing is dead? I'm a growth hacker. We create product market fit. What's interesting about that is that this one was done in 2014, so seven years ago or so. Find scrappy ways to get the word out and optimize with data to grow. What part of that isn't marketing? The hubris? Yeah, well, there's plenty of hubris in marketing. And here's Agile. We didn't have a strategy. We kept changing our minds and we failed repeatedly. Let's tell management we were just being agile. That's a good one, too. Okay, so anyway, always great to hear from from uh, Tom Fishburne. Now let's get over to this one. This one's from Olivia Swan. It took me a little bit to find who actually wrote it because it said it was contributed by Nissan Co., um, who I think has something to do with um, like, like Nielsen reports or something. Maybe it is. Anyway, six classic tactics. And I like that they differentiated these as tactics. Are there any classic marketing? It sounds like, you know, it's got to be it's got to be digital and it's got to be social media and influencers and email marketing. Are there any classic marketing tactics that have withstood the test of time? And what's interesting, because Olivia, I, you know, Olivia, I looked up her background a little bit and she didn't seem to have a whole lot of marketing background, which is excellent because then she doesn't have a particular axe to grind about the newest stuff or the trendy stuff. And uh, compared to the stuff that's been around for literally 150 years, like direct mail. So one is networking and relationship building. She says it's still important to talk to your customers, and it's probably even important to get some face-to-face, -face, which is the second one. Actual, not FaceTime, but actual face-to-face -face time with your, uh, with your audience and your customers. And we're doing that. Uh, I'm driving down to Chicago in a few minutes, and then I'm going to go up to Minnesota and meet with one of the top people in this industry that I'm launching into and see what they think of it. And, you know, it's probably not going to be all positive because that's the way it is. It's a prototype, you know, at this point. But you can pick up body language and other social cues that you can't get when it's left out. Plus, 
you know, as a as somewhat of a veteran in network marketing, uh, you know, I tried to get them to do much more virtual and much more uh, digital uh, sales management techniques. And yet one thing that I couldn't get past uh, was that if I drive three hours to see you and say and present a business idea, you, you may not like the business idea, but you will have to admit that I am I'm at least committed enough to waste the gas. And, you know, and I'd driven, I, I've driven up to Minneapolis just to present a present, to do a presentation, turn around and come right back. You know, and that's like 10 hours round trip. So one of the things that if you get, if you take the time to get to your customers, get to your, get to your prospects, get to your employees and merchants, if you spend the time and money doing that, they know you believe in what you're talking about. And you can't get that across in the same way with just a Zoom meeting. But we're going to have a Zoom meeting on Thursday. <laughs> Offer freebies and or discounts. All, you know, this is tactics. And, and, you know, and a quid pro quo is okay. You know, that means like if, you know, a chance to win. We just did on another, pro, on another business that we're trying to launch. We just did a, a $5,000 trip package. And um, the... And, you know, we didn't probably encourage people enough to, you know, post about it on their own social media, which is in this Olivia mentions in here. Hosting a contest or a free giveaway, you can get your entrance to repost the contest on their social media accounts. Yeah, you can say that that's a requirement to win. Excellent idea. We'll have to do that on the next one. And then we get to direct mail lives. Thank you for that, Olivia. And here's, and it's hard to see this. It's not like impossible. But it's, but it says, if you get the download at WDMA.org, every day we post the show notes. 88% of millennials go through their mail. Uh, 73% look forward to seeing what's in the, uh, what's in the, uh, in the mailbox. And 80%, I can't read it. Anyway, you have to read it. You have to get the answer. Get down there. Okay, so... Uh, everyone really does love mail, you know, and, and of course, when you're in a household with another person, you know, if Chadwick's of Boston comes, I don't care about that. You know, I see it, put it in the mail, look through the mail pile. But if a Cabela's comes, I like that duck soup, you know, that's, but my wife doesn't like it. <laughs> she just as soon I never look at it again. So just because someone in the household doesn't like it doesn't mean that the mailing piece is junk right? One man's junk is another man's treasure. That's what I say. Uh, so direct mail give campaigns give a high return on investment, even higher than paid ad campaigns. And it's especially helpful, as I pointed out, I think it was on Friday, that if you have a small list, if you have a limited number of potential prospects, mail gets high engagement. And even though you're spending more money, at least you'll get their attention. Okay. It's possible to reach target audiences with the right information. You can also, you're not really limited by what you send, not very much. You know, you can, heck, you can send a, you can send a thumb drive with a whole video presentation, or you could send, uh, you know, you can send an iPod, or you could send an iPad if you want. Okay, you can also work, uh, work direct mail with digital campaigns. We talked about that yesterday, and. Um, and put QRs on it to take them to a landing page to drive traffic from the real world into the foo -foo digital world, okay? And then Olivia mentions radio advertising, but the CEO of Nis Nissan Co., um, Evan Nissan, said, uh, don't forget when you're thinking about radio advertising, don't forget the idea of podcasts and web-based streaming audio or web-based streaming radio, like iHeartRadio, which I sometimes listen to sports on. Okay, also, while you're getting all this stuff, re remember to collect testimonials and reviews. Ask people for them. And if they say, well, I'm not much of a writer, you say, well, how about, you know, you tell me about what you're thinking, and I'll send you that, and you just sign off on it and, and post it on your Amazon account or wherever you're putting it. Okay, so testimonials are very powerful. The, 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 the caveat is as you're thinking about these tactics, you want to craft a strategy for how you reach your market. 
So the strategy, each marketing strategy, old and new, has strengths and weaknesses. I think Olivia has conflated st strategy and tactics. Up at the big top, it was tactics. Now she's closing with strategy. And I think as a writer, she thinks, you know, you need synonyms. You need to make it interesting. But in this case, I think they are tactics, mostly. And the strategy is more the market identification. What's your what's your main selling proposition? What's your market fit? What are you going to say? And then you decide what media is going to say it and what you know, what attention getters you're going to use and how you're going to link it with digital or mail or whatever. Those are all tactics. So have a great day. Like and share. Your friends will know you're smart. And don't forget to click on that email and go down there and and let's, best we can, connect because we do and they're very power, powerful and popular. Bye-bye.